guarantee. What kind of guarantee do we have in this life? Well, we really have a very good one. We have a real good guarantee, but it's like a lot of other things. Have you ever bought something that you kept it about a, six or eight months and it broke down and you found out you hadn't mailed the guarantee in? Now that can happen to you spiritually also. Okay. You can just mess around and know there's a guarantee and never quite just reach out there and, and fill that baby out and put your faith with it and send it back to the Lord with love. So uh, is there a word in the Greek that means guarantee? Kind of. Yep, there sure is. It's um, mesites, okay, and it comes from the prime mesos. It means between, middle. I suppose the etymology of the word is uh, no man's land. In other words, a, a space between two people that need to get something together, which is what we see a lot of in this world today. They, they need a no man's land and they don't have one, all right, to kind of separate them in other words. But like the word Mesopotamia means um, the land between the two rivers, okay? So uh, our father sent a savior and he is not necessarily between us and God because if you've seen the son, you've seen the father. He's between us and all adversary that might come against us. He can put a no man's land between you and somebody else just like that, when you use this and if, if you meet the conditions. So what kind of guarantee do you call that? The word actually translates um, mediator uh, into English most often. And what it means is a go-between. It means a reconciler. It means an internunciator. And uh, which is a word we don't use all that often, but you could connect that like with an ambassador, for, for example, to some religious organization or what have you. Well, it happens to be that we have someone we can go to at all times. And when you do, it gives you a guarantee that you're going to be there to meet the promises of God. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the great book of Galatians in the New Testament. Let's read of this uh, promise, the guarantee. You know originally it was the law, the law we were supposed to live by. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3, let's pick it up with verse 17. You're, none of you are going to have any trouble kind of zeroing in here and... and um, and getting with it, so to speak, all right? 17, and this I say, think law for a moment, that the covenant, the contract, the promise that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. In other words, um, even though the promise was made to Abraham and the law came considerably, it, it didn't make it of non-effect, the promise. Why? Well, God guarantees you that he keeps his promises if you meet the conditions. It's that simple. 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise by, by the Holy Spirit, if you would. It was given, that promise, you know, that he was going to bless that people and that people would be a blessing to the world. And of course, what came through that people, Christ, and Christ is the blessing to the world, okay? 19, wherefore then serveth the law? What good was it? It was added because of transgression, till the seed shall come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. That is to say, this is uh, our word again, mesutha, that one in between, the one that stands between. And it was delivered from God 
And did it make the law of non-effect? Well, let's check it out in the next verse, 20. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. In other words, he certainly doesn't have to mediate between himself, does he? No, because he is one. And a mediator is somebody that, uh, that is an um, internunciator between two parties. Okay, but God gave the promise to Abraham. He did it himself. There was no go-between. Okay, I mean, God just said, Abraham, this is it. What does that say to you? When God speaks through his word or otherwise, that's it. You don't need a mediator. Okay. Verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, life eternal, all right, salvation. If a law could have been written that could guarantee you you could make it, verily righteousness should have been by the law. It just doesn't work that way. What, what is the law? What's breaking the law? Breaking the law is to trans, to trans sin, rather, is to break one of God's laws. It's to transgress against the laws of God. Any of you ever done that? Of course, all of us have. Therefore, the law is not able to save us. It took a lot more. It took someone that could stand between and do what we haven't done. And he died on the cross for you, for all of us. Whereas, what is the law good for then? Well, it keeps you out of trouble. It's still good to this day. It says, the law says, thou shalt not steal. I highly recommend that. You know what happens if you do? You're going to end up in the host cow. They don't feed too good down there, okay? Bad business to break the law. That doesn't, the law isn't bad. Guess who is? Us peoples, okay? We can be bad. I hope none of you are quite that bad, but point made. Verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That is ever so conditional. Does it say you have to be perfect? I'm going to tell you something. Now, I don't know about you all, but I know about myself. And I know if I had to wait till I was perfect to attain salvation, I'd be in big trouble. Okay? It didn't say anything about being perfect. It said you've got to believe. You've got to believe that Christ was perfect, that Christ was able, that he could cut it, that he could get it done when we seem to all fall short in one way or the other, all right, some way. And he came to even that playing field for us, all right, 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed, the coming of the Savior, all right, it was revealed. That's why it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, 24, wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. There's no other way to him, beloved. It, you've got to go through the schoolmaster that we might be justified by faith. And you might say, well, I never heard that before. Well, it's true. Why? Because if you break every law in the book, there's no way you could ever come to be a believer. That, that won't fly. You have to know a little about him, who he was, what he stands for, what he signifies, before you could become a believer. And naturally, the Holy Spirit then can move and touch and change lives. But don't ever let someone tell you that the law is bad. Whether, I don't care what kind of law it is, as long as it is a government that has free people. There may be some things about it that may be a little bad, but we can cut it, we can change it, okay? That's what, that's what a republic is about. Verse 25, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, 
Well, what are you under then? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you unction. That means to intuitively know and understand that's wrong. That's bad. You know. And does the, and I'll add one thing further. Then does that make the law bad? No. No, it's still, you know, it doesn't hurt to go back for a refresher course every once in a while, does it? I don't care what your profession if you stand still, you're dead in the water. Doesn't hurt to go back and take a refresher course, whether you're a pilot or whatever. It doesn't matter. Surgeon, you name it. Yeah. Refresher course won't hurt. The law, keep being familiar with it, won't hurt. Why? It keeps you out of trouble. That's, the law is very good. It's man that is very bad. What did Christ accomplish then? Well, bless your heart so that if you broke one of them and did sin, you could repent and it's forgiven. He paid the price. If you're genuine, if you're sincere and on repentance, and do you know something after you repent? A lot of people have, they can't forgive themselves. I'm a better person than that. I'm really a good, good person. I should repent and I know... I should never have done that. Well, hey, how, how can you keep bringing it up if Christ forgives it? That's an insult to him. He doesn't want to hear about it again. It's gone. So change and fit with it and be in him. Okay, uh, let's see, 26. For ye are the children of God by faith in what? Christ Jesus, that he was able, that he was the Son of God, that he was Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's intuitively through the Holy Spirit, the presence. 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. This does not change. The standing as, as an example of the positions that God puts us in in the Millennium Temple. It means that all, I don't care who you are, if you have faith and if you believe, you can attain salvation. Whosoever will. That does not release rightly dividing the word of God. Anyone from the promises God made that his or that or this or that people would accomplish what he said they would do. Okay, I just want to add that because some of you uh, seem to read one verse and you say, well, there ain't no difference in us. Well, there's still a lot of God's word that must be fulfilled. And there are people that must do it. Okay, but the subject being salvation, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a mamzar or whatever the case may be. If you believe, then you have a guarantee of salvation. Why? You're a child of God and He loves you. He still, you know, there's one thing about our Father that I dearly love. He's a strong disciplinarian. By that I mean he's disciplined in everything he does. As it is written, so it will come to pass. As it is written, the divisions in the great book of uh, Ezekiel concerning the millennium. Of who is placed where and what and what for. God knows exactly what he's doing. And there's only one way to get there. And you've got a guarantee of making it. If you grab hold of that internunciator. He is your guarantee. And you hang on. And you believe. And do your best. He counts that and stamps it perfect. Even though it's not. That's why it's an insult to him for you to repent of something and then bring it up again after you know that he has forgiven it. Shame. That is really a shame. You're, it, what it's really saying in your heart, I don't believe Jesus could do it. That's bad. You're treading on dangerous, dangerous ground in that respect. He forgives why. He loves you. Believe him. 
29. And if, there's that great big word again, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That promise that is a guarantee. Well, how can you say that's a guarantee? Because God made it. That's why I can say it's a guarantee. If you meet the conditions, if you are in Christ, to be there, you've got to be a believer. A believer in Christ, which is the living word, meaning this word. But I don't know, I've never read it. Well, then you better get to it, friend. Because it's the letter that God personally wrote to you with instructions especially concerning the end times. And to be a believer, you must at least have a working knowledge, else you're not fit to serve. I mean, you can make it through the door, but it's kind of lazy when one won't work at studying God's Word. Do you know what God says in the Proverbs that a person like that reminds him of? It's pretty heavy, friend. He said... A lazy person, a sluggard, is just like hinges on a door or to a mattress. You want to think about that a minute? A lazy person is just like hinges or to a door only to a mattress. I mean, all they can do is lay there and flop over. All right? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, open, close, open, close. That's all they're fit for. So, you know, uh, a lot of people say, well, dear brother, how Jesus loves everybody. Yeah, he does. But he hates a set of hinges that's glued to a mattress. So, he, I mean, what, do you, what good are they, you know? I mean, you've got to have mercy on mattresses. You wear them out that way. Okay. Anyway, I don't, I don't even know why I brought that into this. I really don't. I don't know what that has to do with our guarantee Somebody, somebody must have needed a little tickle there or something. I don't know. We'll see, won't we? Okay, turn over with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you would. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, and it reads, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. I mean, when you start your day off, do you start it off with something like, Oh God, I need help today. Look at your poor, miserable servant. I just, I don't know how I'm going to make it through, God. I'm glad at least you're praying. But do you ever think about your fellow man? Do you ever pray for our president? Do you ever pray for our nation? Do you ever pray for the poor innocents that are being slaughtered around the world? You know, you should. That's what he's saying here. Okay. Don't, don't be one of these poor me babies. Boy, if there's one... You know, old Marines can't stand poor me babies. We have... We have a treatment that we give them, all right? That's, you shouldn't do Christians that way, though, right? No, you shouldn't, okay, but it works anyway. <laughs> but uh, remember, don't just think about yourself. Think about our brothers and sisters that are really going through it around the world today. And you know something? God pays attention, you know? it does. Good people praying change things, all right? You know, many might say, well, I didn't know about that. Well, listen, do you remember when I defended a certain lady that is a Christian on national television the other day, and you noticed the chipmunks found a hole? Okay, it was done prayerfully. It makes a difference. Why? Because God is with us. God hears us. It does make a difference. That's what he wants you to do. Now, then if you have a problem of your own, follow up with that. Say, Lord, after you fix everything else, if you've got just a minute, uh, my poor old toe sure been bothering me. 
I wasn't watching, watching where I was going, and I stumped it, you know. And then he'll fix your toe, all right, maybe, all right, if you believe, all right. But, you know, I, I'm giving you some very good advice there, and I'm letting you know, using that analogy or that way, call it a metaphor if you like, that's why a lot of people don't get their prayers answered, okay? They're a me, me, I, I. And never our people. And the mark of one of God's elect is the compassion they have on the family. Okay? Everyone. Verse 2. For kings and for all that are in authority, you pray for them. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all good godliness and honesty. In other words, ask that. Pray it. Three, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. That's a strange statement. God, our Savior. Um, God, Yahweh, is our Savior. Well, it is if you add Shua to it, Yeshua, God with us, right? I just wanted to throw that in. Four, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth? And you know, every once in a while, you kind of come, if God is able, is he not? If God really said, who will have all men to be saved? See, that's a mistranslation. You want me to straighten it out for you? Okay, listen to me. Whose will it is to have all men to be saved? Do you know why I can say that without reservation? Because that's exactly how it's translated in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Okay. God is long-suffering, and it is His will that all men come to repentance. Uh, because upon repentance you are saved. Okay. Man's got to do his part. That's, you know, th this starts religions. This is, everybody's going to be saved. God's going to reform all, one and all. It says it right there. Okay. It's his will, and therefore it's going to happen. Now, he hopes that all of his children, that's why we have this opportunity, that's why he sent the Savior. But you're the one that's got to send back the guarantee, okay? Five. And there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, if Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, how can he mediate, be the mediator between us and God. Well, it's different offices. I know that upsets some people when I say that. Um, you could see Christ, but you can't see God because he's in a different dimension than we are. But Christ was in this dimension. You could see him, God with us. You use the word Shekinah, God dwelt there, okay? The last two words of the great book of Ezekiel, Yahweh Shemot in the Hebrew tongue, mean God is there. God lives there. He's with, back with us. That means in the eternity. So then what you pray for, when you pray for the country, when you pray for the nation, the Savior, the office of Savior, Yeshua, takes that to Yahweh, and it is heard. That's why it does make a difference. Uh, Verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, in its own season. Well, if he gave himself for all, then does that mean all are going to be saved? No, he gave himself for all that will believe upon him. Okay. I mean... Um, I do not understand sometimes why people like to, such as communist nations that give things away to people that are non-deserving. Some old boy lays back and won't work and everything, he gets the same thing as somebody, his neighbor. You know, that's a good way to go downhill. Okay. Well, everybody, God knows the difference. He can read your mind. He knows when you love him. He knows when you earn something. He knows when you need a blessing, or let me rephrase that. He knows when you deserve a blessing because deserving is receiving. Undeserving is ain't getting it at all. 
okay? That's Tennessee talk right from the hills. <laughs> That's also Oklahoma talk right from the hills. But that get, I'm a communicator, all right? So if it gets it done, let's get it done, all right? He gave a ransom for whomsoever will. Seven, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Paul always taught to the Israel. He taught the Gentiles and he taught the kings. He taught on three levels. This is one of the worst mistakes that Israelite people or students of God's word make. They're just like praying for, studying for themselves and never for anyone else. They teach just for the higher level and to heck with the little crumbs, those that are just coming in. Never think about them. Okay, so you must never, never, I mean, why are we here? Our purpose is to spread the word to those that don't know, not to those that do, okay? They don't need a physician. So therefore, that's why Paul always taught on three levels. That's why Paul was told by Jesus, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, all on three different levels because one's not going to get it from the other. Okay? you got to have all your bases covered to be successful. So think about that. Okay? A teacher on three levels so was Paul. Verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In other words, don't doubt the Lord. When you pray, expect it. Expect it. If you deserve it. I got some bad news for you if you don't deserve it. You probably shouldn't expect it too much. Okay, I'm talking, salvation is free. Okay. He paid an awesome price, but it is free to you. After that, you pedal your own bicycle, friend. God always has a payday, and he pays you everything you've got coming to you. He only gives man what man has the ability to take care of. You know, uh, sometimes that statement offends people, but it is true. When you get to where you can take care of a little bit more, he'll give you a little bit more. But uh, uh, otherwise, uh, he won't give you a whole lot because a man that is not wise is soon parted with his blessings. So think about it, all right? Well, what should I do about it? Pray for, pray for ability, you know? I do. Boy, I can use all the ability I can get, and I'm not ashamed to admit it, you know? I use all the help from the Holy Spirit I can get uh, in maintaining and, and, and uh, doing what is right. Then God always will pour those blessings on you. Okay? The mediator. He's there. He's ready. What about you? I mean, this is not something that you have to wait till the season opens before you can participate. He paid the price, and it's, the season is open year-round for you to grab that guarantee and fill that little baby out, all right? Do it in prayer, okay? Equate, equate that with prayer, if you would. And it, it doesn't hurt every once in a while to brag on yourself, even though he knows it. Father, I really did a good thing today. I did. Here, here this poor soul was slipping away, and I threw him a rope. <laughs> so spiritually and or otherwise it don't hurt to say it he already knows it but anyway if it makes you feel better he's not going to feel bad about it but talk to him and communicate with him he's your no man's land I, I, many may misunderstand that I'll stop using it okay because we have areas today that are called no man's land that uh, still in Korea from my old battle scuffle over there. It's still there. You're supposed to be safe out in no man's land, but a wise person is very careful to go. Okay, Keep your head down. And when you crawl, you keep the buns very low. Or you can get a trench whipped right across. It's more old Marine Corps talk, okay? Guess we better drop that right away, huh? Okay. 
that he's there though for you, beloved. He's the one in between. Do you know what the one in between? He's right at the right hand of God. He listens to you. And he looks right over and he says, Father, did you hear that? That poor miserable soul. <laughs> Probably not. You know, I'm teasing now, okay? But what I'm saying is your word and your problems get to God like that. You don't need anyone else. You don't need me. You don't need uh, John Doe or whoever. You can just talk to him. And he loves, dearly loves to hear from you. All right, let's, let's do something else here. It's about time. Let's go to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. The guarantee of life, the promises of God. Hebrews, let's go, to, let's go all the way to chapter 8. Nasates, <clears throat> from Eos, in between. Christ is in between. He is our, our um, negotiator. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now, a book, great book of Hebrews. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. I mean, let's sum this whole thing up. You want all the things we've said, this is it. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Heaven, the highest place of all. He's sitting right there. This sums it up, friend. He died on that cross. He was placed in that tomb. But when he ascended, he went right to that, uh, the throne of God. Two, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. I want you to let that verse really sink in. And when somebody asks you, isn't it true that the temple's got to be rebuilt before Christ can return? Well, the answer is yes, but it, all, it was done in three days. You know, or you're way behind the eight ball. You know, he, he rebuilt that tabernacle. He's it. The mediator is your tabernacle, all right? He pitched it, but it wasn't pitched by man, like pitching a tent. Got it? Three. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is necessary that this man have somewhat also to offer. Well, Christ had himself to offer. Let me ask you something. Do you know any preacher all the way down through years that was perfect? I don't. You know, and if you follow man to where you think man's perfect, you're, you've been suckered, okay? And uh, you, maybe there's not too many preachers would say that, but it's true. And I be, a, I be a communicator of truth. There's none of us perfect, but Christ is. Follow the Word of God, not man, okay? But we've got a lot of priests down through, let's go on for, for if we were on earth, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. I mean, they cut that goat's throat just right, bleed that animal before he can be offered to God. They know what they're doing. Uh, animal sacrifices and, and food killed properly. Five, who serve unto the example, or it's just a type. Think of the word, insert in your mind to right above the word example, type and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. What did he say? He said, For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Why? It was important. That simply shows you how the true spiritual salvation and gift of God would come to pass and how the true spiritual tabernacle would be built and why it will never fall, why it is eternal. Uh, marble lasts a long time. Temple floors made out of marble, but the holy temple lasts for an eternity. Okay? Um, verse 5. Who 
Oh, we got that. Okay. Verse um, 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator, there's our word, our guarantee of a better covenant promise, which was established upon better promises. It's more superior. Good English, you bet. It's better. You know why? Because we don't have to depend on bull's blood. Or goat's blood maybe sounds better, huh? Seven. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. God knew what he was doing, okay? Don't say, well, if people just hadn't, if they'd have controlled themselves and had not sinned, we wouldn't be here. Uh, don't be a dreamer. Face reality and get with it, okay? Eight. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Here comes your guarantee, my friend. Nine, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. They couldn't hack it. Okay? So what's, what is he going to do? He's going to make a different covenant, one you can follow. Ten, for this is the covenant that I will. What does I will mean? That's a guarantee if God said it. That's a promise. I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write epigrapho. You know what epigraphics are? You've seen me chase them in, in uh, documentaries, ancient writings, something engraved right in, okay? The, uh, the, and write them in their hearts. It's going to be in their minds. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. The word laws here is a very interesting word. It's not Torah, the, as some would say in Hebrew. It, it is the Greek word uh, um, nomos, and it comes from the prime uh, nemo. And it means like I'm going to equally divide out food, pass out food or pasture. God says, I'm, I'm going to do it evenly and right. God always works right, right? Of course he does. And he's going to pass it out to everybody. And what, what does that bring to pass? Um, when that time comes to pass. Verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Has that been fulfilled yet? Uh-uh. No way. But that's the promise. That's the guarantee. And I guarantee you it shall be fulfilled. Twelve. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness when they repent, of course. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Don't you dare bring it up to me again after you've repented. I don't want to hear about it. I won't remember it. You know, you'd be surprised how many questions I get. Even though I've repented, will my sins be brought up on judgment day? Well, that, that's like saying, that's, you know, that person possibly doesn't think Christ is able to forgive and, and keeps wanting to talk about it, you know. 13, in that he saith, a new covenant he hath made, the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And we come into that eternal age where everybody's going to know what, that's the millennium. But what's going to happen in the millennium if everybody knows the word and we're going to have teachers there for a thousand years, what are they going to be teaching? Discipline. 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 You know, a church without discipline will lose a lot of people to the false messiah because they do not discipline themselves in the word of God. Well, we'd rather talk about something sweet that's going to happen all the time. 
if, if you start talking about controversial things, people will be offended and leave. Bye. You've got to teach the truth and accept it and hope, as God does, that all receive His Word. Is that saying we know everything? Of course not. That's why we study, is to learn more, to be familiar. And that that you do know, be bold. Some might call it, they'll take it as aggressive, okay, be that as it may. But don't, at the same time, do you know the way you nip in the bud that when they say that's aggressive? Don't cast your pearls before swine. You're in the wrong place and you're trying to talk to the wrong person. All right, just don't do it. One more and then we're going to quit. We're going to go to one more and guarantee Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to pick it up. Let's see where I want to pick this up at. 24, verse 24, 12, 24. And, he, you, you know, this is a fantastic chapter because it goes all the way to the end of the world. That's to say of this particular dispensation where God is going to shake this earth again. He's going to shake out wickedness. He's going to shake out that that does not believe. Verse 24, he's just spoken of, um, of um, a great cloud of witnesses that are going to gather themselves together to run a race all the way to the end. You're a part of that race. You hang on for the ride. Verse 24, Hebrews 12. And to Jesus, the mediator, there's our guarantee again, our go-between, of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that uh, speaketh better or more noble things than that of Abel. Why? Abel brought forth vengeance. God's blood brings salvation. 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, that's to say Moses, okay, the lawgiver, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, of course being Christ. Don't refuse him, my dear friends. Um, verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. He's going to shake both. Why? They're coming to an end. That's to say, not heaven and not earth, but the age. The age is coming to an end. He's going to shake them out. 27. And this word, yet once more, signifieth uh, the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. You know what God is saying there? I'm going to get rid of those that just can't cut it, that don't want to. We're going to shake them out for good this time. And many people, you know, bleeding heart Christians, they'll say, oh, we wanted to save everybody. Hey, we're going into heaven here. You want to take them with you to heaven and still put up with it there? The old boy that messed you out of $10,000 on a contract and he's filthy, dirty crook. You want to take him there? No, you don't. He, did he have the same opportunity you do? Of course. Each person, each individual, individual sails their own ship. You can't blame your faults on somebody else. Well, they told me to. Well, you shouldn't have listened. You did it. Okay. That's, where, that's the way the cookie crumbles, friend. Don't, don't be one of these escaped artists that's always said, well, if they just hadn't have done that. No, you did it. You should have known better, maybe. Okay. Do you know why I can say you know better now? 
because we learn from making mistakes, all right? Don't make the same ones again. It's, it's okay to make one, but hey, don't let them do that to you again. What God is saying, I'm going to unload a heavy load here, and they're, they're going, he's going to blot them out, okay? They're just not going to be there anymore. They're gone. Bye-bye, okay? And well, and look, think, think just a moment. Let your mind run back over scriptures. What are you supposed to be standing on? The rock. What rock? Well, Christ, of course, if you're on him, you can't be shaken, all right? It's that simple. You don't have to worry and you don't have to fear. All right, uh, 28. Wherefore, we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptable with reverence and godly fear. You love him, don't you? Look what he's done for you. Verse 29, for our God is, not maybe, not perhaps, our God is a consuming fire. He is able with that fire uh, to consume that that de is deserving of being consumed. And uh, rightfully so. He does it. Okay. And um, okay. I want, I want you to turn back, if you will, to, I want to turn back to chapter 9 in this great book of uh, Hebrews. I've got, I, I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to. Verse 24 of chapter 9. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. For who? For us. In the real tabernacle. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, like, you know, the regular priest did, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, the very beginning. But now once in the end of the world hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. In other words, opening that door, giving you a guarantee, being the mediator, that on your repentance, it's erased. Your sin is gone. It never happened. He is a consuming fire. And that blast of fire erases, blots out. It never happened. 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. 28. So Christ once was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He is our salvation. He is our mediator. He is um, the one that is in between, in that land that protects us, between us and evil. He is our approach to the Heavenly Father, for he is Emmanuel, God with us. We have to understand times and dispensations. Let me tell you something. As it is written in Matthew chapter uh, 10, verse 28 or 5, 25 or 28, Fear not he who can destroy your flesh body, but rather fear he who can cause your soul, that's your spiritual body, to perish to just simply blot it out. So, we have a guarantee. If we believe, I'm going to tell you something. You can count on His promises. You can count on His blessings. Uh, I mean, after all, this ministry itself is kind of a, a proof of that. You know, how many... Uh, and I'm not saying this to say, look at us. I'm saying, how many little bitty churches 
in Northwest Arkansas that, I mean, uh, at best we could round up 120. Well, hey, that was a lot, then, you know. But then God took over. And man, I mean, we're bouncing around the world. And uh, from the Ukraine to China, Japan, I mean, the whole smash, the world, God's world. God's word is, okay? It gets it done. If you try and if you commit, God will bless you. You know something? He guarantees it. And when you need help and when, you, when you're in trouble, you got somebody, friend. You're never alone. He'll never forsake you. He's always there for you. And do you know something? When we can't cut it, He can. He can get it done. And how He loves to help His little ones. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Father. We thank You, Father, for the plan of salvation. We thank You for the guarantee, Father. Give us the ability, Father, to be pleasing unto You and willing servants all. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. That's why the law is wonderful and good. It is man that is bad, okay? Some men are bad. Willis from Georgia. I was listening to you tonight. You said the earth became void. But my Bible said the earth was without form and void. Why did you say it became void? For a very simple reason. The Hebrew in verse 2 is tuhu vabuha, which means the earth became void and without form. Your documentation to back that up, you will find in Isaiah, listen carefully, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18. And it states very clearly there, God did not create the earth void. That's tuhu in the Hebrew but created it to be inhabited. And naturally, when Satan rebelled, then he destroyed the earth age rather than his children. Okay? That's God's love. Um, if, if it would appear to be that you like to study kind of in depth, why don't you order my first three tapes of Genesis under the number 146? I think it would be a real blessing to you. Uh, and... Um, uh, it would seem that uh, you enjoy studying the Word. Bless you. Mark from North Carolina. Since God is all-powerful, why did He need to rest? Mark chapter 2, verse 27. The Sabbath was not created for God, but man. Man's the one that needs to rest, not God. Okay? Mark 2, 27. God didn't need to rest. He did it because he loves his children, though it grieved him he had created them in the flesh also. Genesis 6, uh, verses 3 through 6. Becky from Indiana, question. You probably have said, but I have missed, what does Zerubbabel, what does his name mean? Zerubbabel means born in Babel, meaning born in confusion, to be translated probably Old Zerubbabel was a pretty good old boy. He was born in confusion, but he came out of it. 
And he was a very wise person and God used him tremendously in, in prophetically building the final temple. You'll read of him in, in, um, uh, in Zechariah chapter 4 where he holds that plumb line with the seven eyes in it, the stone that has a plumb. You know what a plumb it is, a plumb bob? It's to keep stuff straight, okay? And he said, old Zerubbabel started it and he'll finish it, okay? John from Arizona. I've been watching your Bible study now for about two months now, and I'm grateful for your teaching. You sure do have a lot of knowledge in teaching God's Word. Well, I've been, I've been teaching for 50 years, and, and, you know, you should pick something up in 50 years. I thank you for that, all right? My question is, is that in Mark 13, 36, it says, If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. Does this mean if we are sleeping, will we miss going to God's kingdom? Or is it just don't get caught not believing if, in God's word? Would you please explain? Sleeping is, is, does not mean literally asleep. It means to, you're a watchman, and watchmen don't sleep on watch. It means spiritually be awake. And that chapter 13 is talking about the coming of the Antichrist first before the true Christ returns. Hey, two months, you're doing great. Proud of you. Hey, and I love you all a lot. Do you know why? Because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. But what's most important about that, it makes Father's Day. And when you make His Day, He's going to bring you blessings. All right, He loves you. Now, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. One thing most important, though, you stay in that Word every day, in His Word, even with trouble. It's a good day. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.